Sockham did not start as a part of any organizing network, as any uh, theory of organizing. It started people putting together an organization that we used to say later accidentally did some things right. In the summer of 1971, three students from the Vanderbilt Student Health Coalition did a land ownership study of the five counties where most of uh, Tennessee's coal was produced at that time and found out that about um, 80 percent of the minerals and about a third of all the surface area of five counties was owned by ten large land holding companies, mainly absentee companies, that at that point paid about three percent of the property taxes. They helped get a lawyer from Nashville to take a case to the state uh, equalization, tax equalization board to say that these land companies were not paying their fair share of taxes. And um, out of that uh, came a first big win. So they decided after the first win, well, let's, um, let's, there's lots of other problems here besides continuing work on this, like how about strip mining is just tearing up our communities and it's driving away jobs. And at that time, strip mining was largely unregulated. And somebody suggested since we had more problems, we ought to just form an organization and uh, fight these pro problems together. And somebody came up with a suggestion to call it Save Our Cumberland Mountains because there was a Save Our Kentucky up in Kentucky. And they said, well, what are we going to call ourselves? Well, we got that Save Our Kentucky up there, Sock. We can't be that, but we can be Save Our Cumberland Mountains, Sock them. And we were fighting it as hard as we could. We really wanted strip mining stopped in Tennessee. That was our, that was my goal. And you just blasted off the tops of and the sides of mountains and you threw the rock and the trees and, and the earth down and it ended up in the creeks and there was tremendous flooding, tremendous blasting problems, I mean slides going across county roads. It was like living in a war zone. Here they are letting all these mountains be destroyed and that's what they've done all these years because these coal companies had more power than the people did. There had been a real serious flood up there by that time and seven people had drowned and, and the flood just came over everybody's field down, down the, through the river there. Coal had ruled in this area. So from the very beginning, it was, um, it was formed with people of great courage who were brave enough to stand up. There was many people hated Sockham's guts in those early years as love us. You know, and we were very controversial because there was so much coal, was such a major part of the economy in some of those counties. So we just worked together. We had confidence that with numbers we could win. Sockham introduced a bill back in, I think, 76, 77, to try to outlaw wildcat mining. And wildcat strip mining meaning people operating totally without a permit, totally outside the law. We actually got that bill passed in the House of Representatives. We had members down every week from coalfield communities where there was illegal mining going on. And it really wasn't until after the federal strip mine law passed that the um, federal enforcers came in and started really trying to enforce the law. In the 80s was a time when Sockham expanded outside the coal fields and started working on other issues for the first, really the first time that didn't have some connection to coal or coal communities. There were leadership retreats out of which there were some major uh, shifts and changes in Sockham. One was a whole look at whether Sockham was basically a coal field issues organization or whether it was a membership organization that would work on any issues that members um, chose to work on. Sockham was a grassroots organization and it wasn't just strictly on environmental issues. We never did uh, try anything that uh, we thought was, wasn't right. There were these low-flying planes that were spraying uh, fertilizers for pine trees and um, herbicides for hardwood trees to try to get pine plantations to grow. Our gardens are being poisoned by herbicides. These people, these timber companies are clear-cutting 
a thousand acres of timber next to us. Then they're coming along and, and spraying from the air. And when those crop dusters go over, they just spray. <laughs> they don't care what they spray on you. I beg them, you know, not to, uh, not to spray us. And they don't care where the, where the streams are. They don't care where the homes are. And they just spray it. That spray flew over us three times, and you could feel the spray every time you'd come over. The crop means more than a human life. So Sockham set up a hotline. We started getting hundreds, literally hundreds of calls. We'd take people in and they would testify about these horror stories about being sprayed and their children being poisoned and people dying and other people, you know, getting sick. Not trying to say you have to stop the spraying. We said put some limitations on it, put some regulations on how you do it, when you do it, the wind drift, uh, whether it should be ground application or through or by plane or what have you. The question was asked, who do we want in the room as SACA members in the year 2000? And one of the answers was a more diverse membership, where people are being shoved around, where there are problems, where there's injustices. That wasn't just the struggle of SACOM folks, but the struggle of African Americans for the kinds of issues they were working on, the struggle in some urban areas for whether it was housing or jobs or whatever, really had an effect on this organization. We don't have a pool to draw from. There are not very many people of color in the area. So we discussed and said, why don't we move then? Why don't we move throughout the state and see can we get diversity involved? It began to open doors uh, for a lot of people, and people began to look at Sockham different. And they had to kind of get used to, uh, to people of color, you know, because there was none where they was at. The board passed a mandate saying that Sockham committed itself to becoming an anti-racist organization. The anti-racism transformation team, art team we call it, we've been quite successful with that. Uh, enlightening a lot of members that, that has never been enlightened before. And I think through that, we'll, we're able to bond even better together. White people can be really empowered allies of people of color, and people of color can find a cultural home in an organization that grew up white. Other gratifying thing about it is the friendships that were created in understanding that their concerns that they have on their particular uh, uh, community are basically the same concerns that I have. I just think the things that mean the most to me is the individuals that I've met through Sockham over the years. I stay with Sockham because I like what the organization is doing. I meet, I meet a lot of people through Sockham that I probably would have never met. Sort of the culture, I think, um, of Sockham as it started has really helped build those kinds of systems of support and social relationships that mean a lot to people. I, I can't say what it means to me. Uh, it's just so important.